Hi. So this series is an investigation into just what it took to create an arcade style shoot 'em up on the ZX Spectrum back in the early 1980s. And in the previous episode, I introduced you to a design for just such a game, admittedly a very derivative design, but nevertheless one that will suit our purposes. So imagine a British teenager, let's call him Jack for the sake of argument, back in the early 1980s, just acquired a brand new ZX Spectrum 48K with the intention of playing a few games for sure, but also learning programming so that he can create his own games. Now, at the moment, Jack knows absolutely nothing about this machine or indeed computing in general, other than how to plug it in and turn it on. But what he does know is that it comes with a built-in programming language, ZX Spectrum Basic. Now, it's not an unreasonable assumption that he should be able to create his first game using that language. Unfortunately for Jack, this is an enterprise that's ultimately doomed to failure and disappointment. And let me show you a typical line of investigation that would lead Jack to this conclusion. Now, right now, Jack has absolutely no idea where to begin. He doesn't, for example, even know how to display something on the screen. But he starts working his way diligently through the hefty tome that is the ZX Spectrum Basic Programming Manual, and he's not got too far into it before he discovers the ubiquitous print command that will indeed allow him to display items on the screen. And armed with this knowledge, Jack is inspired to write his first ever computer program. And it looks something like this. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, the excitement of that first minor success very quickly fades because Jack wants to create an arcade style game. And this is all about graphics, not text. But how does he display graphics on the screen? Well, he reads on and he's not got too much further in before he discovers that there's such a thing as a graphics mode. And if he puts his keyboard into this mode, and he types on the number keys along the top row of the keyboard, he can generate these graphics characters in which a character is divided into four quadrants that are either filled or empty. And the characters that he has gives him every possible combination of these four quadrants. So Jack thinks, great, well, maybe I can use these to generate my game objects or to use the correct computing terminology, sprites. Now, this is the early 1980s, and this is Jack's only computer, so let's assume he doesn't have access to anything as sophisticated as a graphics program. So he does what many people did back then, which is he grabs a pad of graph paper and a pencil, and he sets to work designing his sprites, and he starts with the asteroid from the game. So now he has his design for his first sprite, and he can use these graphics characters to replicate this. And this is what he ends up with. Wow, Jack thinks this is one huge sprite. But I've got this far. I might as well see if I can animate it. Now, when you're using BASIC, the ZX Spectrum screen is divided into 24 rows, each of which can display 32 characters. But normally only the first 22 of those rows are available to print on because the bottom two rows are reserved by BASIC for inputting information and also for displaying error and status messages like the one that you can see here. But it does provide a very useful modifier for the print command, which is the at statement. And this allows you to enter a line number with the lines being numbered from 0 to 21 and a character position with those being numbered from 0 to 31 and to start printing from that precise point on the screen. Great, Jack thinks. This is exactly what I need to be able to animate my sprite. And so he creates another version of his program and it looks like this.
And Jack immediately realizes his error. If he's moving his sprite, he has to erase it in its old position before he redraws it in its new position. Well, no problem, because Jack has discovered there is a command called CLS, which is short for clear screen. So surely all he has to do is insert a clear screen command just before he redraws the sprite in its new position. Oh no, that is just flickery and horrible. So clear screen is just not a solution. But Jack thinks about it for a while and then decides, well, what if I put a frame of spaces around my sprite? Then whichever way I move it, it will just erase itself as it goes. So he tries that. Well, thinks Jack, I suppose that is a slight improvement, but it's still pretty clunky and it doesn't get away from the fact that my sprite is huge. I don't want a game that looks like it's running on a ZX81. So he reads on and shortly thereafter, he discovers there is something called user defined graphics or UDGs. And this is a technique that allows him to use binary numbers to define his own characters. Great things, Jack. If I put four of these characters together, it will give me a 16 by 16 pixel sprite. That's of an appropriate size to the spectrum screen. So he tries that. Great, says Jack, that looks more promising. So now that I've got that as a basis, let me try putting multiple asteroid sprites on screen at the same time, and I'll make them all different colors and all moving in different directions. Jack buries his head in his hands. This is not what he'd been hoping for. There are so many problems with it. The biggest issue is that because UDGs are characters, that Jack can only animate them at a character level. And that places restrictions on the speed that they move and the direction they move. And it just looks very clunky. And on top of that, his current method for erasing each sprite means that when they cross over, they start erasing each other. There has to be a better way. What Jack wants is a way that he can play sprites with a pixel level precision, move them in any direction without restriction and move them at variable speeds. Surely, surely there has to be a way to do this. So Jack returns to the ZX Spectrum programming manual and continues reading. And just as he's about to give up hope, he discovers there is something called the plot command. And this will allow him to set a pixel anywhere he likes on the screen. This is it, Jack thinks. This is exactly what I need. And so he rewrites his program once again, this time, to use the plot command. At first, Jack thinks he's made a mistake because nothing seems to be happening. But then the horrible truth dawns on him. This method of drawing sprites to the screen is just horribly, painfully, unusably slow. So Jack returns despondent to the ZX Spectrum basic programming manual in the hope that 
there will be something some straw to clutch on in the last few pages but sadly no he comes to the end of the book and the end of his dreams or so he thinks and his conclusion is the right conclusion that creating an arcade style shoot em up at least one with slick responsive gameplay is just not feasible using zx basic now, before I get comments complaining about my unfair treatment of ZX Basic, let me just say that I do absolutely think that ZX Spectrum Basic has its place. It introduced a lot of people, myself included, to programming concepts, and I'm sure it launched many, many careers. So I have absolutely nothing against ZX Spectrum Basic. All I'm saying is that it is not suitable for creating this type of game. And I'm not even saying that it's unsuitable for game development as a whole. There are certain types of game that absolutely can be created with ZX Spectrum Basic. And those are any game where the timing of screen updates is not critical. And good examples of that would be digital versions of board games or text adventure games. And indeed, there are some examples of successful commercial games that have been created with ZX Basic. Perhaps the most famous one being Kevin Tom's hugely successful Football Manager series. So it does have its place for certain types of games. It is just this type of game that presents difficulties. Okay, so what is the solution? Well, to find that out, we need to first understand a little bit about what's going on under the hood in the ZX Spectrum when you're running a basic program. At the heart of the Spectrum is an 8-bit microprocessor, the now sadly discontinued Z80A. But the Z80 doesn't understand ZX Basic. It only understands one language, and that's its own low-level machine code, which is a set of instructions represented by numbers called opcodes. Now, machine code, because it's low-level, is notoriously hard to learn and to use to create programs with, especially when you're talking about sophisticated programs like games and business applications. So for that reason, high-level languages like BASIC were developed. So if the Z80 doesn't understand ZX Basic, how does it execute it? Well, there's another chip inside the Spectrum, which is a read-only memory, or ROM. And that has a program that is written in the machine code the Z80 understands. This program is the operating system that does things like read the keyboard, show what you're typing on screen, executing your own programs, and so on. When you run a ZX Basic program, a part of the operating system called an interpreter comes into play. This interpreter fetches the first statement in your program, works out which command you've used, and then looks up an appropriate machine code subroutine in the ROM. It then passes any arguments you've provided to this subroutine and waits for it to execute and return a result. If the program is still running at this point, the interpreter then fetches the next statement and so on until the end of the program is reached or it encounters a stop command or an error occurs. This is of course a hugely simplified description of what happens, which is quite a complex process. But I hope it gives you an idea why the amount of time spent executing the commands in your program is only a small fraction of the overall execution time, and much of that is taken up with the overhead of having to fetch lines from the program, identify the command, look up the right subroutine, and process any arguments. Now, the advantage of doing things this way is that you can type in a command and have it execute immediately, and it's very quick to make changes to your program and then run it again straight away. But this comes with a trade-off, which is a much slower speed of execution. Now, there are other types of high-level language that are compiled. 
C is a good example. When you write programs in C, you can't run them immediately. You must first compile them into machine code before they can be run. That can be a tricky process for beginners, but it does have the advantage that programs run a lot faster. And indeed, you can obtain software that will compile your ZX Spectrum basic programs. So that's an option today, but options were much more limited back in the early 1980s, especially when you were trying to write high performance video games. The solution then is to cut out the middleman Jack will have to write his game directly in machine code. And that's a subject that we'll take up in the next episode. So please do join me for that.